you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee. For the record, I'm William O'Brien. I represent the towns of uh, New Boston, Mount Vernon, Lineboro, Wilton, and Temple. I'm here to present to the committee an amendment to House Bill 1546. Uh, the purpose of this amendment is to solidify religious freedom in the state of New Hampshire. As part of Governor Sahin's disastrous overhaul of medical insurance, which drove dozens of insurers out of New Hampshire, there was uh, two uh, uh, provisions of our laws that were changed, or those provisions added. RSA 14, 415-18-I was added, and 420-A-17-C was added. Both of those provided mandatory contraceptive coverages and insurance policies. Now, I don't believe that Governor Shaheen had the same intent as we see in the Obama administration, which is as part of their political campaign to divide this country and to divide women against Catholics by introducing uh, a mandatory contraceptive coverage in policies and then backing off and saying, well, it really doesn't exist. Oh, the, the insurers, however, have to provide it. But that is what uh, the Obama administration is trying to do. And by doing that, they're trampling on our religious freedoms. We look at this law and see now that that is the result of, of this law. And the importance of this amendment is to make it clear that insurers, as, as well as uh, companies buying insurance that have religious objections to providing uh, any of uh, these services covered by those uh, sections do not have to do so. This amendment is a simple solution to a much larger problem, of course. The amendment before you, however, is a way of guaranteeing religious freedom by ensuring mm -hmm. that we are not forcing employers to purchase health care coverage that violates their tenets or their beliefs. The larger problem, of course, is the federal Obamacare law that all mandates that all Americans must buy health insurance or face fines or imprisonment. It is a true shame that this disastrous law is being misused the way that we see it's being used on the federal level, on the national level. And it's, it's unfortunate that we're forced to come here today to offer relief to the people of faith to ensure that they're not forced to buy a product that they believe is immoral. Ultimately, of course, the answer is to stop the Obamacare law so that we at the state level are not forced to attempt to resolve the myriad of problems that this terrible policy is causing. This amendment is just one of many bills that we have passed, we hopefully will pass, and hopefully will continue to pass, uh, deal with these spiraling consequences of Obamacare. care. We should not be here today forced to pass this amendment to protect religious freedoms, but we are, and we'll continue on our efforts to do so in New Hampshire. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, of course. Okay, uh, and uh, the clerk will request a copy of the testimony. Uh, I will give you notes later. Thank you. Um, no, it doesn't. Representative Dollar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you mentioned about the, the law that was put into place under um, Governor Shaheen's tenure. And what I would like to know is, um, since that law has been in place for 12 years and there has been no challenge to it in the courts or anywhere else, um, why now and why not um, within those 12 years if it's so onerous and something that's you know, hampering religious freedom, why didn't it hamper religious freedom in these 12 years? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question, Representative. My understanding is that many of those who would have run afoul of this law uh, avoided that by being self-insured. And why now? Because the defect is pointed out now. Why now? Because it's clear that the operation of this law would infringe on our religious freedoms. This has nothing to do with contraception. contraception. It has nothing to do with sterilization or chemical abortions. What it has to do with is religious freedom individuals being allowed to exercise their religious beliefs without having government come and say, you can't do so, or you'll be fined, or you'll be in prison. That's why not. And follow up, if you're self-insured, then what's the problem? Because they don't have to. The problem, thank you for the question, the problem is this law. The problem is, is a law that says, if you go to the marketplace to buy insurance, you have to abandon your religious oh, beliefs. 
when you purchase that policy. That's wrong for this country. It's wrong for New Hampshire. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for taking the question. So I would like to follow up. I, I understand that you're obviously quite passionate uh, about your testimony, and I understand that your perspective is that everyone should have free access to the market, and in, I guess in the, in, the, in the scope of your testimony, be able to carry along with them all of their beliefs and uh, all of what you believe to be their constitutional protection. But are you testifying that organizations have some sort of an explicit uh, or implicit right to always access the market and not be subject to any of the conditions that exist in a properly regulated market, in this case an insurance market? Uh, thanks for the question. No, you overstate the issue. Uh, the issue is the First Amendment. The issue is uh, right at the beginning of our Bill of Rights where it says our religious freedoms are paramount. And if we have long-held religious beliefs, that a new administration is seeking to take over one-sixth of our economy uh, says you have to abandon those in, in pursuit of our secular goals, then truly the First Amendment says that that's unconstitutional. And we here in New Hampshire should not have statutes that violate the uh, century-old traditions of this country. And this statute, without this amendment, would do that. Thank you for taking my follow-up question. I, again, I understand uh, the passion. I'm, I'm familiar with the First Amendment and uh, you know what research I've done and given the time frame that we had. It seems to me that there's quite a long history of uh, Supreme Court rulings that do not rule as an absolute that First Amendment protections carry uh, on into the, the, the public space and that an otherwise valid public law cannot simply be trumped by any particular individual or sex religious uh, beliefs. So wh why would access to the private insurance market, uh, why would these individuals on, who, on whose behalf you, you are bringing forth this amendment essentially expect absolute and complete protection of those amendments once they, once they leave the four walls of their religious church, if you will, and enter into the public space? Uh, thanks for the question. Are you suggesting that we are religious people only within four walls? We hold these beliefs as part of who we are, and these are long-held beliefs. And whether or not they're popular beliefs, and whether or not they can be uh, misconstrued as the Obama administration would seek to do so in its efforts to divide its way to a 51%, divide us to uh, uh, allow it to achieve a 51% vote in the upcoming national election. Uh, is a goal. It's not sufficient for people to say outside the four walls you subject yourself to uh, laws that violate traditional religious beliefs. No rights are absolute. But the attempt by the Obama administration and the operation of this law in New Hampshire, as uh, we now discover, would certainly run afoul of beliefs that should be respected by any government that operates under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Um, I'm getting caught in the weeds here <laughs> with religion, but when those Supreme lunches. Court <laughs> when those Supreme Court rulings came down that said Quakers must serve in the military, they, they may not be on the battlefront, but they must serve in the military. Uh, when when the Mormon Church had to give up polygamy, weren't those all instances of where a valid law was passed and? and religious institutions had to give up some of their practices? Thank you for the question. Your question illustrates a reasonable accommodation to the Quakers. They didn't have to fight, uh, serve in a violent uh, capacity because it was truly a long-held belief and of their religion that they ought not to do so. So there was reasonable accommodation. These RSAs, without this amendment, the Obama administration rule has no reasonable accommodation. It's basically saying to people who hold beliefs that are contrary to their secular beliefs, you'll go to prison. You will give up your, your uh, money and time if you don't hold the line. That's improper. 
Uh, how about the Jehovah Witnesses, which don't believe in blood transfusions? I, I, I can't think of an insurance, anyone I know that has insurance policy that isn't eligible for blood transfusions. Look, you know, thanks for the question. We, we, can, we can reach out, for example, after example, that there may be a majority opinion that you say, you know, that just doesn't sound reasonable. What we're talking about here is this statute and the Obama administration, what it did it was, uh, in its recent ruling, which basically took what is a long held and non controversial belief within our, our religion that is shared by many, many Americans and said, abandon it in the face of fines and imprisonment. That's wrong. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and Representative, for appearing before us today and subjecting yourself to questions. Uh, I think there's a distinction uh, between an employee of a church and an employee of a church-related hospital or school. In, in the context of my question, I'm referring to employees of hospitals and schools. The hospitals and schools advertise in the broad uh, general public in the employment market. And they, and they generally employ not on the basis of your religion, but just on the basis of your qualifications. So my concern goes to the equal protection provisions of our federal constitution. If a member, an employee is not a member of the faith of that institution, and it's imposed upon them a certain faith-based doctrine, are we not violating the equal protection provisions of the federal constitution? And I would like to speak to that issue. Thanks for the question. I, I think the concern is artificial and contrived. If you go to work for a Catholic hospital, if you go to work for a Catholic school, you know you're working for a Catholic institution, and you know that they hold beliefs that either you can choose to uh, uh, understand and understand it's going to, uh, they're going to uh, inform their choices and, and how they deal with their employment, or you choose not to accept that employment. To say, for example, that I should go to work for a parochial school, and that school, because <coughs> I want it, should provide me coverages that are repugnant to the uh, beliefs of the faith that operates that school isn't an equal protection argument. It's basically a contrived argument. Every one of us understand that as we go to work for a religious operated uh, institution, that it's going to be operated by that religion. Thank you for re your response, and that does define the issue. Hmm. Seeing no further questions, the chair has a question. Mr. Speaker, would you agree with me that not providing uh, contraceptive or uh, organ health care does not disturb the public peace and nor does it disturb others in their religious, religious worship? I would agree with you, Mr. Chairman. Then wouldn't we be compelled under our Constitution, which says that every individual has a natural and unalienable right to worship God according to the dictate of his own conscience? and reason, and no subject shall be hurt, molested, or restrained in his personal liberty or estate for worshiping God in the manner and season most agreeable to the dictates of his own conscience or religious profession, sentiments, or persuasion, provided he does not disturb the public peace or disturb others in their religious worship, compels us to pass this. Mr. Chairman, among our framers, there was a complete understanding of the importance of religious freedom. We find it articulated in the language of the Hampshire Constitution from 1784. We find it articulated in the Bill of Rights that was a condition of many states in agreeing to pass the federal constitution. It was fundamental to who we are as a country. It remains fundamental to who we are as a people and hopefully continue to be as a country. This trampling on our religious rights by a presidential administration seeking temporary electoral advantage by trying to once again divide us as it tries to divide us on class lines, and wealth lines, and now on religious lines and on gender lines needs to be rejected. We, we saw it in the policy that came out of uh, 
uh, the Obama administration. We see it here, unfortunately, reflected in laws that were imprudently put in place, both in terms of their effect on the insurance marketplace, but now we see in terms of their effect on our religious freedom. This amendment needs to be passed. Mm -hmm. Seeing no further questions, thank you. Thank you. The chair would now call Representative Andrew Manus, uh, co-sponsor, and uh, I believe to be the primary author of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee, for taking my testimony uh, a second time on this effort, uh, this very important effort. I'm Representative Andrew Manus, uh, representing Rockingham 5, the town of Gary. I, what I just saw, I wanted to point out with our last, the last testimony uh, that was came before me, was one religious faith trying to use government to force contrary religious tenets on another religion. The very reason we have religious freedom protections in our Constitution. The religious oppression is forcing a church-run organization to pay for procedures for which their religion disallows. Now, I get to my testimony. My effort to amend HB 1546, a certainly more appropriate uh, bill for this amendment, with religious and conscientious objection language, is to ensure the religious liberties of religious organizations are protected under law as required by our Constitution. It is unconstitutional for government to force religious institutions to pay for products that they object to on religious grounds. This effort has nothing to do with the merit of contraceptives, as I personally do not object to their use. I do, however, object to the idea that government care, that government can force a religious organization to pay for procedures or services that they find objectionable according to the teachings of their religion. Additionally, this religious exemption will not prevent doctors from prescribing contraceptives to patients, either as use for birth control or as use for other ailments. In the first case, a patient working for a religious organization may have to pay for the birth control out of pocket, while a patient working for a religious organization would likely be covered for other uses of contraceptives that don't involve birth control or contraception because the religious objection is not there for that use. Again, this bill is about religious liberty. Government should never have the power to force a religion to violate its own teachings. That is truly the worst sort of religious oppression, the very type that people fled from when they established this country. And I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative, for taking my questions. My first question is, you testified that uh, quote unquote, forcing an organization to pay for product or services uh, to which they object morally, I'm paraphrasing you a bit there, is unconstitutional. So saying that it is unconstitutional is a um, very specific sort of statement. So I'm wondering if you could explain to the committee the precedent court cases or the, the, the precedent jurisprudence that establishes that doing that is in fact Constitution. Certainly. In this country, we have a separation of church and state established by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution prohibits the, the Congress from establishing a law that would establish a church as the official church of the United States, such as the Church of England, uh, the Anglican Church, that is, or the Islamic State in, in Islam, or the Jewish State in Is Israel. Um, those are prohibited by our Constitution. We cannot have an established religion in our country. However, that same amendment also prohibits the Congress and all governments, uh, by extension of the 14th Amendment, uh, from stopping the free expression of religion and the free exercise thereof, is the, I think the direct quote. And this precisely hits on the point that we're talking about here. Thank you. Um, thank you for your answer. Uh, I would disagree with you, uh, and was wondering if you could comment on the fact that uh, in the 1982 court case, United States versus Lee, uh, the Supreme Court specifically found that the United that laws can, in fact, require uh, 
religious sects or organizations to participate um, in, in uh, the otherwise normal practice of, of following uh, a, an otherwise, quote unquote, otherwise valid law. That, that case had to do with specifically the Amish, who took their case all the way to the Supreme Court, objecting to paying Social Security taxes. And the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that because where the Social Security tax requirements are a valid law, they apply equally to everyone, that there was no infringement on religious principles, and in fact, they were compelled to pay. And there are numerous other court cases, and I wonder if you could respond to that, but more specifically to this quote from Antony uh, Scalia, who you may you know is a uh, devout Catholics and conservatives currently serving on the Supreme Court. Hmm. We, meaning the Supreme Court, have never held that an individual's religious beliefs excuse him from compliance with an otherwise valid law prohibiting conduct. In, in this case, the court case that he was speaking to dealt with prohibited con conduct. Prohibiting conduct that the state is free to regulate. On the contrary, the record of more than a century of our free exercise jurisprudence contradicts that uh, proposition. So could you, could you respond to the fact that the Supreme Court has already found that religious orders can be conditionally compelled to do that which they would otherwise object to? I find um, that I don't have a lot of familiar, familiarity with the case you cited. However, I would say that the Supreme Court has a history of misinterpreting the First Amendment. And um, I think it is incumbent on this legislature to interpret it properly and respect the religious liberty of the churches and religious organizations in this country. Uh, it's one of the uh, main missions that I'm here for, frankly. I, religious liberty is number one reason that this country was founded. It's why people came here for religious freedom. So the uh, decision by Justice Scalia is abhorrent to me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I asked this question of, of Speaker O'Brien when he was um, testifying. I'd like to ask it of you. Uh, you know that the law has been in New Hampshire to co cover um, contraceptives for, um, in our state for 12 years. And it's been in place for 12 years, and I have heard nary a peep about it. There has been no challenge to it in our courts. There is, it was passed under a Republican legislature with people who are now in Republican leadership were actually sponsors of the bill. And all of a sudden now, there's a problem 12 years later. Could you please explain why there is that gap? I have the same answer that the speaker does. Do I need to say anything else? Could you please? I'd rather not. I mean, the, we found out about this because of the onerous uh, requirements and chutzpah of our president. And um, it was something that we weren't aware of previously. And, and, and now we are, and we're going to take corrective action. I've seen no further questions. The chair has a couple of questions, but I guess I'm going to apologize for this one in advance. <laughs> Do you have any connection with the Roman Catholic Church? I was raised Catholic. I am not a Catholic now. Were you approached in any way in regard to this amendment by the Roman Catholic Church? I was not. I, uh, to clarify my last statement, I am a Bible-believing uh, Christian, but I am not a Catholic, and I do not agree with the Church's um, belief in this uh, current debate. Uh, that contraception is immoral, I don't believe that personally. But I do believe that the church has the right to religious freedom. And I have a further question, and I, I respect the uh, referencing of the First Amendment, but would you not agree that, with me that we also swear an oath to uphold the Constitution of New Hampshire, and where the Constitution of New Hampshire might be more restrictive upon the actions of government than the Constitution of the United States and how it has been interpreted, interpreted by that Supreme Court. We are obligated to our Constitution and it is our in individual duty to interpret it and apply it. 
I would say uh, very appropriately that uh, the, que the, the question is very appropriate, and uh, I agree with it, and that uh, our Constitution in Article 4 very clearly articulates that we have a freedom of conscience, a right which is inalienable. You, there is no uh, equivalent that be, can be given for it. Uh, other natural rights are um, certainly, uh, you, you have to give some natural rights up in society in order to live within that society when there is an exchange, such as security, um, for that, the giving up of that right. Um, and I think some of our property rights fit into that category. But when you have a freedom of conscience, that's there's no equivalent that you can give to that. And religious conscience is one of those freedoms of conscience that are, we are obligated to protect. And again, going back to Representative Taylor's comment, I mean, I we didn't know about this before. Yes, that's our fault. But now that we do know about it, we're taking action to make sure our Constitution is enforced in this state and that it means something. And that's important. Representative Dahl, you have a further question? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, um, your answer sort of reminded me of a follow-up question. Um, so did this, um, the impetus for this come from constituents and citizens of New Hampshire or any other citizens, or did it come from legislators? Because since over the 12 years, there hasn't been any challenge to the law, and I haven't heard anything from constituents asking for limiting a woman's access to birth control, I was, this law come out of, um, did any constituents come and ask you to put this amendment in, or did it come from legislative will? Well, let me, let me uh, answer your question thoroughly. Um, first, I would say that legislators are elected for their judgment. They are not elected to bend to the winds of a few loud activists. We are elected for our judgment, which we articulate during our campaigns. And if the people agree with that judgment that we've articulated, they elect us. If we then, through the exercise of that judgment, do not fit the will of the people, we are not re-elected. And, but, you know, it, it is that process, I think, that gets lost on a lot of people who uh, bend to the whims of maybe 20 angry emails directed at them, which which do not reflect the opinion of the entire uh, electorate. And I think it's important for a representative to use his own or her own judgment um, when representing the people, and certainly to listen to the concerns of constituents, and certainly to take them into consideration. And I do that every day. Now, to specifically answer your question, I did, in fact, hear from constituents who are outraged that the Obama administration was going to force the Catholic Church to provide services against their own, their, their own religious tenets. I heard from several. Uh, in fact, and I also um, personally found it objectionable, and as a citizen of this state, I have the right uh, and as a legislature, legislator, I have the right to bring forward an effort to correct uh, our constitutional wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, now, finally, I think the article in the Concord Monitor misrepresented what happened, and I think this goes back to one of the other questions that Representative Itza was asking me. I actually approached the church on my own with a request for language that would help um, fix this problem. They did not approach me, I approached them. So, to, just to be clear about how this, that all happened. Cody. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, it occurred to me, in your research for writing this amendment, did it, uh, did you do it, find that any Catholic schools or hospitals that are self-insured do or do not provide contraceptive care? Because of this law, I understand that most of them are self-insured and they're blocked out of the insurance marketplace. Well, which, I understand that, but do which, they Which I think is, uh, is something that is wrong. I would echo the this, this speaker's sentiments. So you don't know if they do I, or No, I don't. I, I don't think it's relevant. I think that to block 
uh, a religious organization from an entire free market marketplace is simply wrong. We should not be forcing products on our citizens. That's just not what this country was founded for. Thank you. I, I'm aware of the time. I, I did want to clarify something, Representative. Thank you for taking my quick question. I, I understand your passion. Obviously, from a philosophical point of view, we disagree, but I want to clarify a statement. Under, under current law in New Hampshire, uh, I, I don't believe anyone is ever forced to purchase health insurance under state law. I do believe that if you choose to purchase health insurance, and you have a, uh, an issue with uh, the morality of the state mandates, you can self-insure, um, or you can make the choice to enter into the marketplace that we have, such as it is in, uh, in New Hampshire. So could you, could you juxtapose those comments that I just made with your claim that individuals are being forced to purchase a product that contains products or services that, that violate their morality? I disagree with the premise. This isn't about that at all. This is about um, forcing uh, a religious organization to pay for uh, something that they disagree with on religious grounds um, if they want to participate in something that's available to the whole uh, state population of organizations. And everyone should be treated equally under the law. This is um, this religious exemption will ensure that the church can be treated equally under the law. Representative Zucci and I would remind the members we do have to get some bills out, so unless this, this question is critical. I'll, I'll phrase this in a would you believe basis. I have received, would you believe, quite a few inquiries by email. I get an awful lot of emails and several phone calls, some of which were against the bill, many of which were for the bill and for the amendment. And these were totally unsolicited, and I asked several of them in particular, what faith are they? And it was a cross-section, to use a, a hacking phrase, it was a rainbow of people. Some were Jewish, one was Mormon, uh, several were other religions other than Catholicism. So this was a, an issue that I found was <coughs> across the board, and I kept the tally of the ratio. Uh, it was slightly more were against it than were for it. Well, thank you for the question. I would believe it. Um, I think that uh, a, a large um, number of New Hampshire residents, at the very least, understand the reasons why our state and our nation were founded. They understand the importance of religious liberties. I think that that's what reflected in, in the emails we received. But again, I return to what I said to Representative Taylor. I don't think that we should be making decisions based on how many emails we receive for or against a, a, a particular piece of legislation. Again, we're elected for our judgment, and I do hope that all of you use your best judgment uh, when it comes to deciding the fate of this legislation. Are there any other questions for Representative Manu? Representative King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Representative Manu, given that you said this is not a Catholic Church bill, but you choose, chose to reach out to them, um, and that this is not a contraception bill, um, but this is about purchasing, being forced to purchase products. Well, I, do you have the same opposition to the provision of our law that requires bariatric surgery to be covered? I mean, I, I, I don't know uh, how to answer the question other than to say that uh, if there is a religious uh, tenant that objects to that particular procedure, then certainly I would. Um, I, I know that we already passed the law that repealed that mandate, and I was, I was a supporter of that repeal, so um, I think we already have things underway to take care of that. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you, Representative. Thank you. Uh, oh, may we have a copy of your testimony? Sure, I've got notes on it, but that's okay. Go for it. Um, uh, the chair would call Representative uh, Megan McIntyre. I mean, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Megan McIntyre. Megan McIntyre. Thank you, Sonia. <laughs> 
Relax.